All right, guys, welcome back. Earn Your Leisure. We are back in New York. Yes. And um, very special episode, something that, you know, has been in the works for a few years now. Mm -hmm. So finally getting it done, for sure. More, most importantly, we're getting it done. Yeah. <laughs> Ingrid Best. Um, did I say your first name correctly? Absolutely. Ingrid Best. So from the Bay Area originally. Mm -hmm. Now you live in SoCal. But um, you have a spirits business. I do. I have a wine business. I'm, I'm just waiting for you to say originally, because, you know, New York really claims you. I uh, know. I just get so caught up. <laughs> I was born in New York. Okay. I was raised in the Bay Area. There we go. I really like to say I grew up in San Francisco. I got my muscle from Oakland. There we go. What does that mean? So, it's where I became a woman. But did you ever live in Oakland, or you just yeah. going across the bridge? Yeah, I graduated from Oakland High School. Okay. I had my son in Oakland. Okay. And um, it's, I had a, my business, my promotions business was in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just all the things that I think really were the foundation for the woman that I am today is is from Oakland. Yeah, it's, sure. it's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bay is crazy because it's like San Francisco, once you cross the bridges, it's like, it's like a different world. Taylor, like, two cities. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, not only the Bay, right, but even Northern California, the Southern California, you know, in one state, it's just so different. Yeah. So... I like to say I've had the best of a lot of worlds, mm. you know? For sure. Yeah. Cali's so big, though. It would be essentially like New York, Virginia. Right. Like that's how large it is from, you know, coast to coast. So, um, all right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. I only want to know you're obviously an entrepreneur. You have your art collector as well. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about that as well. So, um, but I want to start with the wine. Um, Okay, so this is the wine right here. That's right? the wine. I Best is the name <laughs> of the wine, right? Yeah, it's my namesake, I Best Wines. And um, it's my way of definitely putting some legacy on the shelf. So, okay, well, what's the process? What's your, your journey in the spirits industry to even get to this point? And at what point do you decide that you want to take a leap of faith and create your own product? So 20 plus years I've been in the wine and spirits business. I've worked for three of the largest suppliers in the world. I've worked on two joint ventures. And I think it was the exposure to just seeing what those businessmen did in the wine and spirits industry that really inspired me. I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm helping everybody make all this money. What was your role? <clears throat> so I started out as an ambassador. Um, that's how I started. And I launched a small rum brand for Diageo. And through that role, I just got hyper exposed to every function, which typically in ambassador roles, you don't always get exposed to that level. I did. And so I quickly realized, I was like, I love this. Because before that, I was a street promoter. I did street promotions in, on the music side. And I realized, I was like, oh, this is like working records. Working these, you know, brands is like working records. So it was... I think I just had a natural talent for it. And so I started as an ambassador, then I moved into a hybrid role, sales and marketing, which was good for me. Initially, I really fought being in a sales role because I was like, it's not sexy. I don't want to do this. I'm a marketer. I do promotions. But learning the commercial side of the business made me so well-rounded. Like I was unstoppable because I understood how to sell. And then um, got a role just on marketing proper on Hennessy during the revitalization period of Hennessy because there was a period where nobody was... What, what, really what, year, what time frame are we talking about with the revitalization? Because some of the listeners are like, this has always been hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would say from probably 2000 and like 15 until about a couple of years ago. What, when the Hennessy fell off? No, that ha that we actually did oh, a revitalization, re revitalization. on Hennessy. Was that like when Nas, when Nas got involved? When Nas got involved. Were you part were, of that? Yeah, we were all part of that. And there was an incredible group of people that were working on Hennessy at the time. You know how you have those teams that get assembled and you're like, that's the team. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible team and it was a special moment and definitely a defining moment for me to, to see such a, like, I think, legacy brand and iconic, iconic brand be reimagined, right? Because at one point, people really saw Hennessy as like your dad's drink. <laughs> and then it was like, how do we make this young and hot and fresh? And we did that. And it had a great run. And then here comes tequila, which is what's happening now, right? 
So I did that. I worked on the Hennessy team, and then I worked on the Belvedere team because the gentleman who was running Hennessy got the job to try to revitalize Belvedere. And, uh, and I did that for a bit. And then I got a call from the Rock Nation team saying, we need someone to fill this role on Doucet to manage the joint venture for Bacardi and, and Rock Nation. And what they really were looking for was somebody who had the business side, right? Who did understand the commercial, the marketing, the promotion, but culture. And there's not a lot of people, unfortunately, in corporate that have that check all those boxes. So then I went to run the joint venture on the Bacardi side. And I did that for two years and it was incredible, as you guys can imagine. Yeah. And at the time, again, Cognac was very much so having its moment. You know, Doucet is a great brand and we built an incredible team and definitely got the attention of bigger brands like a Hennessy. You know, we were considered one of those ankle biters, like, what are they doing? How are they doing this? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the power of obviously Rock Nation and Jay and everything that they've built. And then I got a call from Puff's team saying, we need somebody that understands joint ventures, that knows how to run, you know, run this business. We're at a critical point. The joint venture has been around for a while. We just need to bring breathe some life into it. Yeah. So each one of these brands are looking at you for your expertise because not just because you're a marketing genius, but because you're telling stories. Correct. I feel like that that's the part. Even when you we spoke about the Hennessy thing, I remember. I mean, we first for me it was like watching Mob Deep and Prodigy has a jersey on. I'm like, what's that? Right. To now where I'm hearing Nas narrate stories. Right. And now it it feels different. And so where did, where did you get the sense of storytelling, right? Is it from that love of music or was it just a natural instinct that you had? Yeah, I definitely would say, you know, music is my first love. In mm -hmm. my mind, I was going to be a big music executive. Like okay. nobody couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to like run a label, launch a label. Music is really my first love. And during the street promotion days, that's what you were doing. You were telling these stories for these artists in your markets. And so I took that and I applied it to how I would tell stories around brands. And all these brands have long legacy. I mean, crazy legacy. They're, you know, some of these brands are 300 years old. The problem is those stories aren't stories about us because these brands aren't owned by us. And so when you get a marketer that can then make it relatable to a whole new generation, to cultures, um, that's what I, I realized that I was really good at doing that. And I was really good at building teams to do that, you know, putting together the right pieces of the puzzle to do it. So for instance, on Doucet, you know, I hired a, a, a black Parisian guy, moved him from Paris to New York to work on Doucet because Doucet is a French brand. Who better else to tell the story than a French black guy, right? And to do education and do all that kind of stuff. So I think my sweet spot was like understanding how to story tell, but doing it through building great teams. Yeah. So, so all right. So you're establishing yourself. When do you leave the corporate world and become an entrepreneur? Yeah. So I, I, I called Puff and I said, you know, it's time for me to launch my wine. And when, when I took the job with him, you know, I told him this is going to be my last job. You know, I know that if I'm forever working, if I don't give myself a like exit plan, I'm going to do this forever. Because listen, the checks are nice. It's nice to be an executive. It's nice to have all the budgets and all the bells and whistles. Uh, and you get, you can get very comfortable. And so I knew I didn't want to find myself just getting too comfortable. And so I told him, I said, listen, it's time. I got to take this leap of faith. And he fully supported me and was like, you know what? I already know that you're going to do your thing. Like, and I'm here to support you any way I can. And I'm forever grateful to him for that. And so two years ago, I resigned and I went on a missionary to launch this brand, you know, and it really was this life changing trip to South Africa where I was like, why they didn't tell us that this was here? But of course they didn't tell us, right? We had to go find it for With the vineyards? Yeah. They have vineyards in South Africa. Oh man, it's one of the most beautiful wine regions in the world and some of the most incredible wine in the world. And for people in wine, they know South African wine. For real wine collectors, real wine connoisseurs, 
people who, you know, travel, they absolutely know about the wine region. But here I was 20 years in the game. I didn't know anything about South African wine. And I like to consider myself, you know, someone who was really in the know. I had traveled the world for wine. So how did you find you just randomly was in yeah. South Africa or you went there specifically looking for it? Yeah. So my girl, Angela, got hired for a gig in South Africa. And she called me. She said, I'm going to South Africa. You want to come? I was like, what? She's like, it's the week of your birthday. I was like, say no more. I booked my ticket and I'm, I went to South Africa. And I was actually there a few days before her. And then she arrived. And I just remember like being in restaurants and you would open up the, because of course I always go, I'm conditioned to look <laughs> at the wine list, okay. look at, right? And I'm like, South Africa, South Africa. I'm like, look at this wine list. Like, look at these wines. And it was really that trip that just like made me want to go and ex like really understand what was going on. And so then we decided, um, so that was the first trip. It was really a casual trip. It was just girlfriends hanging out. But I remember those wine lists like stuck with me. I was like, this wine is really good. And then um, we activated around Global Citizens when it was in South Africa. So I basically added a few days in advance of the trip and I went to the wine region. And that's when I was like, oh, okay, that's what's going on here. They've been hiding this. They've been hiding this from us. And initially I was gonna launch a wine from Napa cause I'm from the Bay. The, I mean, I could have done that with my eyes closed, but you know, telling this story about South Africa and the truth is I really fell in love with South Africa. Like I love it. It feels like home to me. I planted my roots there. And I knew that I didn't want to do anything that wasn't disruptive. Like I knew if I just did Napa, like that was expected. So launching from South Africa was certainly the disruptive route, which makes sense for me. I mean, it's a life changing trip. Outside of just falling in love with the country and finding the wine, I know art plays a part in that. We'll get to that a little bit later. But what's step one now, right? Like you found out that this is, I think, the third largest wine region in, in yeah. the country, in the world. In the world. In the world. You have the vision for it. I, I want to create my, I have to be disruptive. Napa's not going to do it because everybody does that. Right. What's step one now? When you get back and create the plan, what does it look like? Um, so step one was really, um, I prayed about it. Mm. <laughs> that was step one. Step one, I, I prayed. I was like, okay, you know, God, tell me if this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and the answer was yes. And then I would say the next step, was connecting with people in South Africa. And the biggest thing for me was I wanted to make sure that no one in the wine industry in South Africa would feel any offense to me as a black woman, like touting the South African wine renaissance, right? Cause I'm still a black woman from America. And so I think it was super important for me to like connect with winemakers, connect, just really understand the background of the wine region. You know, listen, the black farmers, black winemakers, I mean, apartheid, like, I just really did a lot of research. So I wasn't going into this as like a naive American, which I think a lot of times we do, you know, I wanted to be respectful, I wanted to be tasteful. And I wanted to do this with South African people. So that was, I would say, you know, after praying, it was like, okay, find the people that are going to tell you yay or nay. And everyone that I spoke to was so excited. They were like, man, we've been waiting for America to really understand what's going on with South African wine. This sounds amazing. You know, I got so much love and so much blessing. I really felt like I needed to ask a bit of permission mm -hmm. just from a respectful standpoint. Not yeah. that I, not that I can't do what I want to do as a business, but just out of pure integrity and respect. And everyone was so supportive. And from that, I was like, oh, it's on. As you're going through that, the research and doing the due diligence, finding the right people in South Africa, are you finding that other brands are there as well? And did some of them surprise you, right? Because a lot of times when we think wine, we think French, mm -hmm. or we think, like you said, Napa Valley, we right. never think South Africa. Were there brands there already that have been taking advantage of this? That's a great question. What I'll tell you is the first thing I noticed on that very first trip was how much the big brands that we know here in America are tapped into South Africa. So big, big brands are doing tons of av advertising, tons of activations. They're locked in. They see the opportunity in South Africa, right? Even when we did the activation with Doucet for Global Citizen, like I remember coming back and saying, we got to lock in in South Africa because I could see what all these brands were doing. 
I would say from a wine perspective, if you know wine, there are going to be some wines that are familiar to you, but only if you know wine, right? And so that's where, for me, iBest Wines becomes like the icon. Like, I want this brand to be the icon of South African wines here in the United States, because I don't think there is one. And it's not to say they're not offered. There's some great wines being sold here, but none of them have reached iconic status. I don't think any wine brand, to be honest with you, has has really taken the position of being an icon. There's a lot of great wines, but when you think about spirits, you can think of the icons, right? There are some brands, especially in culture, that are iconic. And in my mind, iBest Wines is going to be the iconic brand for culture in the wine space. So, okay, so you established South Africa as the, the way to go. Um, from the business side, like what's needed to actually get this off the ground? Like you have to talk to the manufacturers and get a distribution deal to bottle it up, like give them a percentage of that. Like how does the inner workings of that business actually work? Yeah. So the inner workings, I mean, listen, the 20 plus years that I spent in the game, it was, it was like, it was the manual for me to do this. And I, I wouldn't have been able to do this the way that I've done it, if it wasn't for the 20 years of foundation that I had in this business. And so the first thing was like, first of all, building a model that was going to make us money. Because wine is not an easy thing to make money off of. The margins oftentimes aren't as impressive as most people I think would think they would be. So for me, the first brief to like my finance girl was like, I want the wine to be like spirits. In, in the spirits world, 35, 40% margins are typical. In the wine world, is 20 to 25. I was like, I want I wanted the margins to be at 40%. Like, this is like a spirits brand. Because I knew the inner workings of mm -hmm. that piece of the business. So wine and spirits are two different things. Wine and spirits are two spirits different things. Spirits is alcohol. Yeah, spirits are, you know, your cognacs, your tequilas, tequilas vodka. your vodkas, and, and wine is wine. And champagne is champagne. And champagne is champagne. Yeah. And in South Africa, they make champagne, but because it's not made in champagne, it's called MCC. Mm. Um, because, you know, there's all these laws and these rules, but um, sh South Africa has incredible sparkling wine. You said the average margins is 20% for wines, right? Yeah, 20, 25%. And you said you wanted yeah. 40%. Yeah. So, okay. How were you, how did you envision getting 40% when the average is 20%? Well, I think one of the things that I understood was in South Africa, you can get very, really good quality wine. And the cost of doing business is much lower than the cost of doing business other places. So, the quality of my wine, for instance, if I was producing this in a Napa or even a France, you know, in some instances would be double, triple. And so understanding that and again, building these relationships in South Africa so we weren't going out there, you know, blind. Um, that was the first thing was to understand, like, I, I don't want to cut corners on quality, but I know based on just purely relationships, we can get the wine that we want to then help us get to the margins that we want to be at. So, so the, the order in the spirits and I guess wine industry, supplier, distributor, customer. It's a three-tier system in the U.S. Right? Yep. So is it similar in South Africa? And, and how are you navigating through that there? Right? Are you finding, you're the, the supplier. I'm the supplier. Right? So you're finding the distribution system. Yeah. What is that system like there as opposed to here? Right? What are some of the differences right. that you experience? Yeah. So I'm the supplier. I have a partnership with a winery, one of the premier wineries in Stellenbosch. It, that was probably the longest part of the process was identifying who was going to be the right partner. Because there's a lot of basic things like integrity is super important to me. Like, I don't care if you make great wine. Like, how do you treat your people? you know, what the winery environment is like. And then it was super important for me to connect with a winemaker who understood my vision that was going to like follow my brief in terms of like what I wanted to do from a blending perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to do that. And then I would say secondarily, it was just thinking about everything from like the packaging, the design, like all of that and making sure that it made sense, business sense, right? So everything is done in South Africa. Nothing is done here. Mm. The only thing that's here is the owners 
me, my team, um, who are equ who are equity owners. Um, but everything else, everything that you see on this pack is done in South Africa. So how is the exporting process work as yeah. far as I'm assuming you, you're shipping bulk product? Like, is that done at one time or you do like, you know, every month you get order shipments that come in? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very intricate process, which is why I mentioned earlier, I wouldn't have been able to do this. I, the, you know, the chops that I have from 20 years in the business have have positioned me to, to get through what this process requires. So it's it's first, you know, identifying what you what you want to produce, blending it, going through the bottling process, you know, the packaging process, and then, you know, getting it on an actual container, on a cargo ship, cargo ship goes from continent to continent, getting it through customs, and then working with dist a distribution network to get it out. In my case, um, you know, I've done this 100% myself. Like, I own this brand 100% myself. So I did every part of that process. And I have five incredible women that have been working with me, women that I've met just at different points in my career who trusted me, understood the vision. And what I said to them was like, these are all the roles that we're going to need to make this happen. And I'm going to give all of you equity. And so everybody had their piece of the, of the puzzle when we made it happen. Again, it's not easy to do. It requires a lot of know-how. It requires um, patience. You know, you can't rush this process because ultimately, beautiful pack, but when you open it, if the wine isn't good, it doesn't mean anything. So so before there were equity partners, it was just you. Just me. And this is, I don't know if I don't want anybody to get this misconstrued. This is not an, an easy thing to do, number one, but it's cash intensive as well. So how did you get funding? Was it self-funded? What was that process like? Yeah. 100% self-funded. So all my capital went into this. Um, you know, I made good decisions in my life. Real estate, art investing, saving, just understanding, you know, that cash is so important. Um, and and I knew that, w that there was going to come a time that, like, all those decisions would come into play. And this is this is the result of that, right? So, yeah, it just, was just me in terms of, investing my own capital and then the women on the team have invested their time and that's equally as valuable right because without a team and without people to build it with i mean their their time is as valuable as my capital because they have been the ones that have been helping me move the pieces which is why making sure that they all got equity in the business was so important to me um a month before i launched five friends who are all women came to me and said, listen, we'd see what you build and we already know, you know what you're doing. This is going to be amazing. Like we want to invest in this. So five black women came together and invested um, in the business. But before then it was, it was just me. So um, you have a winery that you get your wine from, right? Yes. I'm assuming you're not the only person that gets wine from that winery. No. Yeah. So they do, they do tons of white labeling projects, um, this is a proprietary to iBest Wines. These blends I actually blended with, with the winemaker. I've I've shared a lot of that across my social channels because I wanted people to see what it took for me to build this. Mm. Um, but the winery is, you know, best in class, award winning, and they do tons of of business around the world. And they were so excited about this. So how do you make your wine different from somebody else's wine? That's is coming from the same vineyard. Yeah. So, so what's the process of actually making it different? So these are, again, these are blends with specific percentages, you know, that we actually said, I love Chenin Blanc, I love Sauvignon Blanc, and then Chardonnay from South, South Africa is so different than other places in the world that I was like, let's show people how great Chardonnay is from South Africa. So we blended those three blends, right? And then for the red, same thing. It's, ca it's cab dominant, but Petite Syrah, Shiraz, Malbec. So these are my own proprietary blends based on like the wine that I love, but then also understanding the wine that consumers love. Like, and that's, that's done in the winery. That's done in the winery. So it's not like a farm where like everybody's getting the same chicken. No, no. Everybody's blends are different. People use 
sulfates and this and I mean everybody's process is what different. are you blending it with like what, what exactly to the to the average person doesn't know mm-hmm. like what you're talking about as far as like what what wine what is that getting blended with so there's three so I'll use the white as an example so there's three varietals three different grape varieties in the white wine there's a Chardonnay a Chenin Blanc and a Sauvignon Blanc that gets rested in oak barrels it sits right that's where a lot of times you get that like um, smooth, oaky, you know, whether it's the nose or the or the taste. And then that process goes through a fruit- filtra- filtration process. There are some things that are added to just stabilize the wine, all natural. So that's another thing I think that's important for people to understand. The process in other places outside of the U.S. tends to be a lot cleaner. So wine that wines and spirits that are being produced in the U.S., typically don't go through as much astringencies as wines and and spirits being produced outside of the U.S. And I mean, that just goes to like our food source and all that. Like the U.S., as as big and as powerful we are, there's a lot of of bullshit that goes on here, right? Yes. So very clean, um, you know, process in terms of, um, you know, what's in the wine. It's considered vegan. It's not organic but it is considered vegan, and then it gets bottled. And typically, for instance, we bottled these wines in June. You want to let a wine be bottled anywhere from four to six months because the wine goes through bottle shock. I mean, it's fruit, right? It's alive. So four to six months after bottling, the wine is tasting perfect. So you bottle it in June, which is why you had to launch in October. Correct. Got that point. It has to get on. I mean, it's literally going continent to continent. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's some shipping routes that are two weeks. You pay them for that. You want something to get from Africa to the U.S. in two weeks? It's a premium. Some shipping times are 60 days. You know, we I didn't want the wine on the water that long, so we did two weeks. So the, from a distribution standpoint, where are the, the largest places that you're shipping to? And, I mean, because you can have the bottle, you can have the right taste, but if it's not placed in the right position, right? Right. If it's not marketed correctly, if it's not sitting in the right shelves, if it's not at the right restaurant, Mm -hmm. it's not going to move. No. So number one, where are we distributing outside of the continent and the country and within the country? How does that look, right? Because we know what wine and spirits looks like in America, but what does that look like in South Africa? Yeah. So um, just to speak to the distribution piece, um, I elected to go with a smaller distributor that I knew could help us do all the things like customs and, and a lot of the areas where a lot of brands, they get stuck. You know, you don't have that foundational, just like, how do I even get it into the country? I know so many people who tried to launch brands and their product is sitting in customs still. So went with a reputable, smaller distributor. I knew that we would launch online first just to give us an opportunity to get it out there. And now the process of securing larger distributors is underway, which I feel confident again, because I know that world and I have those relationships and I can make those phone calls. And so we launched online. We sold out of a two week pre-sale in six hours. I mean, that's how excited people were about the wine hundreds of cases in six hours all over the United States, which was really, really um, felt good, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And now the work begins to actually build, get it into on-premise, which is restaurants and, you know, nightclubs. And for me, where I see the brand again, this is this is the new icon for me when 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 people think about, you know, when they're out or when they're in a cultural moment, I want iBest Wines to be that like iconic wine brand. And so we're being really specific about where we want to see the brand, right? Where we think it should show up. But there's also like just the pure business, right? Do I want to be in Target? Absolutely. Why? Because I shop at Target. I spend a lot of money in Target. There's a lot of shoppers that look like us in Target, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there was a day in time where new brands felt they couldn't have those kind of ambition that they felt that they had to build and start small and then... And for me, even though this is a new brand, it's a big brand. Like, I'm a big brand, right? So I want to show up that way, and I want to show up that way fast. And we are, you know, of course, working with smaller retailers. We appreciate smaller retailers. My first stop was in Oakland to wine bars and wine shops. But the goal is is, is to have this be a very, very big brand and very lucrative. It's a lot of money in the wine and spirits 
space. And I know firsthand just because of the 20 year career I've had. So um, how do you get into art investing? <laughs> so, you know, I used to get these big bonuses. The, the wine and spirits business is, is a bonus based business. And uh, I would get these big bonuses and I would, you know, buy a watch, buy a purse, buy all the toys. The things. The things. <laughs> I like things. And I remember hearing a record. I think it was a J record. And he talked about art. And I was like, I have not bought that yet. You know, it like it pricked my conscience. And the first real piece that I invested in was a piece of art from South Africa from an artist named Nelson Makomo. He was an incredible artist. And the reason why I say invest in it is because it was literally half my bonus. And I and it was hard for people to understand. They were like, you're going to spend what? You're going to, what? What are you talking? That's a lot of money. Just because we haven't really been taught the value. How much, how much was it? It was like $25,000. And who educated you to know that that was something that you should buy? Well, in, in, in with that purchase, I just loved it. You just looked at it and just like I it. loved it, and I I researched the artists, and it I mean it fell in line with just kind of me falling in love with South Africa too, you know. And I loved it, so I think the first thing that I always like to tell people is even though I invest in art, I only invest in what I love. Like if I don't love it, I'm not really going to spend my money on it. And so I've been really fortunate to get to know a lot of artists directly, buy from artists directly, so you circumvent the, the whole gallery and all that kind of stuff. And you're supporting the artist, like the artist is getting 100%. How much is that worth now? Do you know? Um, uh, I don't know. That, that's interesting, right? I see it, I love it's it. It's definitely worth more than what I bought it for. I'm, I'm assuming that. <laughs> Maybe it was Picasso Babies, the J song that, yeah. that might have sparked it, but... Does that now spark your love for art or is, did it just transition to, to South African art, right? Did you start studying art, American artists, artists throughout the world, and now this becomes a passion for you based on that one purchase? Yeah, you know what I realized? Um, art for me was, oh, I just got lost in it. Like, I, I realized, I was like, I love this. Like, I, I had just, like, this genuine passion for it. I didn't grow up going to museums. I didn't grow up going to art exhibits. I didn't grow up in a house where there was art. Um, and so I think for me, I was like, oh, wait, we belong here, too. You know, that it was really that that fueled me. I was like, wait, this is, this is a space that we belong in as well. And there's such an incredible art community. So I also was enjoying, like, getting to meet people, you know, and those people are, like, involved in, and some cool stuff, you know? So I think it was that definitely, you know, African art, art, black artists in general, you know, was, was something that I was like, okay, I love this. These stories are incredible. And then it became like, yeah, like, you know, I remember buying a piece. You asked about the value. I bought a piece for like $12,000. And I remember seeing an, an auction for the, the artist and her piece sold for $90,000. And like, I have one of her bigger pieces, earlier works that I bought for $12,000. That's clearly gone up in value. So I then also started just to understand like, oh, okay, this is how that works. And then I think when you study really wealthy people, really wealthy people have a few things in common. They have real estate. A lot of them have a lot of investment in wine and they invest in art. And I was like, oh, okay, this all kind of makes <laughs> sense for me. You know, this is the space that I play in anyway. So how many pieces do you have? Roughly. Oh, now um, I probably have over 40 or 50 pieces of art and, so, and everything, not just, you know, I have sculptures, I have vases, I have, I mean, you know, I mean, so where, where, do, where do you, where do you keep it all? It's everywhere. I mean, it's in my bathrooms, it's on the floors. But does it ever get to a point? Cause it's like, all right, you could invest in a variety of things that art is some way where it has to be kept. Right. Mm -hmm. So after a while, it's like, you can't really fully appreciate it, I don't think, because you can't put it on your wall. You can't put 50 pieces of art on one wall, right? right? So it's like you could put it in your office, you can put it in different places, but when you really start to get a lot of art, I'm always curious to know, like, wh what are people doing with all, all of the art? that they Are they just hoarding it in take the basement? The Dame, take the Dame Dash roll. Yeah, I mean, listen, people do have... Um you know, art storages that are specific for art, just like they have wine storages. 
Um, for me, I'm working to sell a lot of wine so I could buy a nice big house so I could have all my art <laughs> up in it. You know, I mean, now it's because the art, the art storage, that kind of, I don't understand that. I used to go, I used to go to art um, school when I was young, but I don't understand art storage because the point of art is to be appreciated. And if you're just storing it, I feel like it's actually disrespectful to the art form, right? Because yeah. now you've taken the the beauty out of it, and now it's just become like a file cabinet. Yeah. You know? I think it's a double entendre. And you use the word appreciate it. While it's stored, it is appreciating. It's appreciating. But it's, I get what you're saying. I look at art. From an artist standpoint, I understand the business. Yeah. But art should always come first. The yeah. business should come second. Well, right. some people create galleries, right? They create their own galleries, yeah. which... I mean, I know people who have, like, bought the houses next to their house, and the house next to the house... It's for art. art. It's, the, it's a gallery. Which is amazing, right? Yeah. So I'm with you, like, part, and when you ask me, like, the buying, you know, my rationale around buying, I only buy what I love because, like you, I want it up. I want to see it. I want to appreciate it. I also want to share it with people. So, like, when friends come over, they'll be like, your house is like a museum. And that makes me <laughs> feel so good. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, yeah. So um, everybody does it for a different reason. But what I could tell you is, again, one thing I learned is that People that understand wealth, they into art, they into wine, and they into real estate. Well, one thing I learned about art is that if you put it in um, your office, it's a tax write-off. It is a tax write-off. Yeah. So I was I was saying the, the one of the places that we definitely know that your art is going to show up is the Smithsonian. Yes. Well, talk about that. I mean, that that's something that people will be able to frequent and you yeah. go down in history forever, right? Yeah, that's exciting. So uh, myself and 10 collectors uh, got together... We, we've now acquired three pieces together and it's, it's our way of, you know, collective economics. And we purchased a piece, a, B, a Bisa Butler piece that we then donated to the Smithsonian Museum in, in DC. And so my name will forever be on the museum walls at the Smithsonian as a donor of the piece. And not even that little thing, right? Like we talk about like having the art in your home and wanting to see it. I remember thinking like, wow, donating to a museum. But that's really also a big part of, you know, the art world, art collecting, and also increasing the value of your collection. So my collection inadvertently increases in value because I own a piece in, in a museum. Mm. And, and people who are in the art world, they know all these little nuances. Yeah, do you see... Because we talk about it in real estate, right? A lot of times, if, if people can't afford the property, mm -hmm. let's have a collective. Maybe mm -hmm. it's five people and we make the down payment or right. we go into... Do you see that in the... Is that something that happens in the art world often, especially amongst our community? You know, I don't want to misspeak. I, you know, the collective that I'm a part of, that was the first instance that I had ever heard of it. Okay. I'm sure people are doing it. I just don't know. You know, the, the two pieces we bought... Um, they were both $150,000 each. They go together. It's Adam and Eve by Harmonia Rosales. So the the total price of the work was $300,000. And when we all thought about it, we were like, I can't do that, but I could do this. And so 10 of us got together and purchased it. The, those two pieces have been on, on display at different museums. It's actually at the Spelman Museum right now. Um, and so we're allowing the work to just tour so people get to experience it. And once we did that one, we were like, all right, let's keep doing this. This is amazing. So I, I don't want to say that it, it does happen, but I don't want to say that it doesn't happen. I just wasn't aware of it. I know that when we had the opportunity to do it together, I said, come on, y'all, let's do this because it was $30,000. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm part owner of $300,000 worth of art. Yeah, that's and that's just that one buy. So what are, like, some best practices for people that want to get into art? Like, is it, like, always go through a art dealer, have insurance? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like when you buy a watch, right? Like, you can, it's best practices to go to an authorized dealer as opposed to just a jeweler. Right. It's best practices to have insurance on the watch. Right. What are some of the best practices for art buying? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I've been really fortunate. I've been able to buy a lot of art directly through art, through artists. And, and the reason why I say fortunate is because, one, you get to know who you're buying the work from. I mean, this work is in your home. It's energy, right? A lot of these pieces have stories. These artists may be going through different things while they're actually creating the work. And so um, 
you know, I'm I'm an advocate for people that want to get to know the artists if you can. It's worked for me. Uh, secondarily, you know, I've gotten to know some galleries that I respect that I think are doing good by artists. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to have some galleries in your rep repertoire. Only buy what you can afford. And so I would say that that's my biggest advice to people. You know, I've never financed any art, although you can. Mm -hmm. You know, there are financing programs for art, but I just like to think um, for good financial hy hygiene, buy what you can afford. That's worked for me. You absolutely have to insure your art and you have to make sure that it's a reputable insurance that specializes in art insurance. You need to think about where the art is going to be in your home. A lot of light is is not friends, is not art's friend. Like a lot of light, light, light. Yeah. So it, how it ruins it. It can. Yeah, it can. So you know, making sure that the art is in a position in your home that it isn't getting damaged. Making sure that you're framing with a reputable framer that's going to talk to you about UV glass versus museum glass. I mean, this is all the stuff that goes into thinking about preserving your art. And then, you know, I have not been someone who's gotten into the business of selling my art. I know people that are in that business of selling. I can't say that I would never do it. For me, it's legacy building. So this is what I'm going to leave behind for my son, my goddaughters, my grandchild. You know what I mean? Like, this is really legacy building for me and wealth building for them. So I think it's just making sure you get educated like you do in anything that you're going to be investing your money. And the last thing I'll say is the 10 people that I invested in art, I respect all those people. I, I, res, I expect their profo, res, respect their portfolios, right? What they've done with their money. I would have never just gotten with 10 people and bought some art that I didn't know I felt were a good fit in what I was trying to do. Because that's a relationship. You're getting into a, a business relationship with them. But I think the biggest thing is buy what you can afford. And then do all the due diligence, the insurance and all that kind of thing to make sure you're protecting your asset. So when it's touring, the museums are paying to have it on display? How, how does that work? Yeah, so sometimes um, you will get paid by museums to have the work. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's that you're donating it because you want the the connection. You want to lean into the equity of, the, of, of I think, um, the institution, right? A lot of these institutions have incredible equity. Smithsonian, for example, I mean, for me to say that I've been collecting for five, six years and I already have my name in the Smithsonian Museum is like a big deal. <laughs> so, you know, it's a it's a mix. But yeah, there are times when institutions will pay you to um, to actually have your art in their exhibits. So I'm going to talk about why mm -hmm. art, but can you talk about South Africa and give an insight because you have a relationship with the country yeah. from a variety of different standpoints. Um, so how... What do you see as far as opportunity in South Africa? South Africa is an interesting place because, um, you know, it it's, has the largest economy, I think, for Africa, but mm -hmm. it's mostly controlled by white people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody knows about apartheid or they should know about apartheid. And, you know, the formal system was broken, but the economic system never really changed. No. So you still have the minority in rule of the majority mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the economics of it. So a lot of people don't even look at South Africa as like a true African nation. Right. Um, but I would like your perspective from actually spending time out there. Yeah. I mean, listen, South Africa is absolutely a true African nation. It's Africa. And, um, you know, the I think the effects of apartheid are still very apparent, just like the effects of slavery here in the U.S. are still very apparent. But I certainly know that there is this younger generation that's so clear about the fact that they're about to change their own personal situations and change the, the climate of the country. And, and those are the people that I've been able to connect with. You know, specifically in my journey to launch this wine, I connected with a 26-year-old winemaker, Black South African winemaker, Haley September, who graduated with a wine degree, going back to get her master's. And, you know, it's those kind of stories that are going to change the situation for South Africa. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's still so many issues 
I mean, so many issues. I, mean, I read Trevor Noah's book. Have you read that? No, I haven't. It's actually really good. So he yeah. talked about even like the different, like, I guess we wouldn't be considered black in South Africa. We'd be no, colored. We'd be colored. Right? Yeah. So this white colored and this black. Correct. Talk about that, because that's interesting. Yeah. People from America probably can't understand that. I mean, we understand light skin. We we know that, but to, we don't have, like, set different classes as far as that's yeah. concerned. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it from my own personal experience. For instance, the young lady who I was just talking about, she would be considered colored. Um, I never call her colored. I'm like, Haley's black South African, because that's not my reality. And it's not that I'm trying to be disrespectful, but it's just not, it's not the reality that we live in, but it's real for them. There's so much colorism, you know, um, is wild. And again, what I can tell you is that the younger generation is so aware that a lot of that is just a trap to keep, you know, their minds stuck in a certain place, to see us different when we should all see ourselves the same. But it does exist. And I think the beautiful opportunity for Black folks in America and Africans is that our stories are so similar. You know, um, there's varying degrees, but I've, I feel so at home when I'm in South Africa. Like, I've sat with brothers in South Africa that remind me of you two, you know? So I think dispelling the myth that there's so much difference, and I think also dispelling the myth that, you know, incredible place with so much wealth. I mean, there's so much wealth in Africa. It's wild, and a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people still believe that, you know, the only thing to do there is safaris and, you know, they're starving children. It's like that couldn't be farther from the truth. And like any country, there is poverty and there are issues, but it's beautiful, you know. And, and I think the last thing is, again, the notion that somehow South Africa isn't part of, you know, the African nation is wild. It's crazy. And I think it's hurtful to Africans in South Africa. You know, I, I, I've heard them say, like, I don't know why anybody would think that. You know, and so when you, they, they, they are aware of that. Yeah, that that. The, oh, yeah, for sure. If you're black and you didn't grow up in the hood and in, in the U.S. that like somehow you're not black. I was like, we all black when we walk out the door, everybody just right. And so I think it's even hurtful for me to hear hear that because I've spent so much time in South Africa and it's absolutely Africa. I've been to Ghana. I've been to Nigeria. I've been to Africa. And I'm never in South Africa like this is in Africa. This feels different. You know what I mean? You know, like this is very much so Africa. You know, and the tradition and the beauty of the tradition um, is just very powerful. And so I think my biggest thing with I Best Wines is also showing Black Americans we should be doing business on the continent. So I, I think it's interesting because when you create business, you have an opportunity to create narrative. Right. And so with I Best, how do you intertwine? Right, Ingrid's story, mm -hmm. this this region story, mm -hmm. this cultural story together. How, how are you navigating that? What is the story of I Best um, that the world needs to hear? Yeah, the story is really it's it is a blending and a celebration of culture. That's really what this is. And so for me, you know, really telling the story of like here I am, a black woman from America who went to South Africa and just fell in love and felt at home. And then quickly understood that, like, I could do business. I could do business here. You know, like, this is this place is ripe for us to go and do business. And not only can I do business, but I have the support of the people to do the business, right? And so IBEST is really just a celebration of culture, global culture. I consider myself a global citizen. I've been all over the world. I love the world. I love traveling. And so I, I hope it's my way of transporting people to South Africa to experience South Africa just a bit. And I also hope that it's a way to have people understand that, like, the comfortable thing was Napa. The disruptive thing was South Africa. So um, when Akon has said, like, you know, everybody, every black person from America should go to Africa and start a business and you become a millionaire. A lot. Of, I was talking to somebody and I understand what he meant by that, but the how-to part is the what's missing, right? And yeah. that's the that's very important. So you as an American who actually went to Africa and started a business, what advice would you give people um, from the States or from anywhere in the diaspora that's looking to tap in with Africa? Like, 
as far as, um, you know, cultural experiences and how to network properly, how to mm-hmm. communicate. Like, what, what, what would you give as far as advice based off of your own personal experience? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing that I would say is specifically Black Americans, we do a lot of Caribbean, we do a lot of Europe. Do some Africa, just you know, travel, just, just go. Like, like the, fir- the first thing is like, go. Get the vibe. I mean, as Americans, we have the freedom to travel anywhere in the world. Our passport, like that's one thing that you realize when you're in Africa, that like the constraints for Africans to just travel around Africa is bananas, but that's by design, right? That's purely by design. We have that freedom. And so the first advice would be go. If you've been to Italy five times, it's time for you to go to South Africa once. If you've been to Turks and Caicos six times, it's time for you to go to Ghana once. If you've been to, right, think about where we all go and we spend our money. Paris, so, London. All of that. So my first advice would be go, tap in, um, and 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 wait to be widely, wildly surprised by what you're going to uncover when you get there. The second thing is like, our brothers and sisters in Africa are waiting for us to come. So when we land, they're like, welcome home. You know, so understand that you're also going into an environment where people are welcoming you. They want you there. They want to connect with you. And then I think like with anything, you're going to find your people. I found my people. It wasn't that hard, you know, so I knew that I wanted to do this business. I sought out to find the people that would help me do this business. And so I just think that we've been taught that Africa is this really difficult thing for us to do. And it's actually much easier for us to do than we know. And so I would say the first thing is just like, go, you know? So the majority of your time is is here or is it, it's it's here, right? The last last two years, the majority of my time was South Africa. People all but thought I moved there and I all but did because I needed, I needed to tap in. I needed to be there. Um, It's been nice to be back home. Obviously, I had to prepare to get the brand launched. Home is Southern California. But now I'm going to be on the road, you know, slanging wine. I want people to taste the wine. I want people to experience the wine. People are excited about it. I want to tell the story as well. And, um, And just get, you know, just help breathe some, like, fun new energy into the wine space. I think wine has been you know, marketed and it's also been like looked at a certain way. And to me, this is like the A side and the B side of a really great record that I want everyone to hear. Yeah, so the, because I'm thinking to myself, the business formation is happening, happened in South Africa. Correct. That means the trademarking, the licensing, even the taxes are done there. How's that experience been yeah. from knowing what, you know, you've been in this spirits industry, like you said, for over 20 years here in America. How has that transition been for you from the legality standpoint side yeah. in South Africa? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a dual path, right? Because we have to do all that stuff here, too. I mean, I'm an American. The, the business is also established here, too. Um, the trademark actually was surprisingly the easiest thing to get, and I thought it was going to be the hardest because the the name Best, right, you, you would think I had already been sewn up 50 times. And so that was, like, the easiest thing to do. But I think... In South Africa, it hasn't been as difficult to navigate because remember, the wine region and wine in South Africa is hundreds of years old. So it's not like I just came and I'm doing this for the first time. It's a very established business, um, very established industry. So it actually wasn't difficult at all to do um, because wine is what they do. I mean, it's one of the biggest wine regions in the world, so it wasn't difficult. I'm sure in other industries, depending on what you're looking to get into, may be a little bit more difficult because you just got to figure out how to do it. But with the wine piece of it, it actually wasn't that hard. The hardest part for me was landing on the blends that I love, that I was ready to feel comfortable to actually say, like, this is this is the product. But I would say the foundational pieces, the legal pieces, they weren't difficult. How has it been? Um, you have a son, right? I have a son, yeah. How is that as far as traveling and how is that as far as parenting? Yeah, my son is 29. Oh, well. I was a teenage mom. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's I was easy. a... Makes I it a lot easier. That's it. Makes it a lot easier. Thank makes you. It a lot I, know, easier. I know I look younger than what I am. No, I had Take my Take it son, as a compliment. Yeah, it is a compliment. <laughs> I had my son at 18 years old. Okay. 
And um, so now he's 29. He's very proud. He understands that this is legacy mm. that we're building. And I actually just became a grandmother. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. yeah. I just became a grandmother. So my, I had my first little grandson. So this is really legacy. Yeah. I mean, he was born within days of, of this launch. launch. Yes, yeah, wow. so it was like two births, you know, at the same time. But I will tell you, looking back at my career and being a teenage mother and having to figure all that out, it wasn't easy. And thank God for my mother. And I think a lot of us, right, rely on the grandparent, especially when you're younger and you have children. So my mother was was absolutely co-parenting with me. Um, and so luckily now at this phase of my life, I don't have a young, young one other than my grandson. But I know a lot of people that are out here grinding, trying to navigate parenthood. And it's not it's not easy. No, for sure. Yeah. Do y'all yeah. talk about succession? Does he find in this business interesting? Is it something like you guys working together? I know at one point you said that being a team mom, you have to grow together, right? Yeah. Like you're growing as an adult and you're raising somebody. So you're growing. Are, is that synonymous now with this business? Yeah, I think, um, listen, everybody knows that I'm doing this for legacy purposes, including him. Mm -hmm. I, I think he is still wrapping himself around his head around like, my mom is the talent of this thing, right? Everybody's been talking to me like, how does it feel to be the talent of IBS? Well, I'm like, talent, because I never saw myself as that. I think my son is processing that part, mm. that like people want to, you know, interview his mom and talk to his mom and I, I have my autograph on the bottles because I'm just his mom, you know? So I think that's probably the thing he's navigating most. He's seen me in this business for so long, so he understands it and he's like, you about to get that money, mom. You know, like he, <laughs> in the, that part, he's like, this is really exciting. Um, but I also haven't necessarily forced him to be in the business. You know, I, I think I think the wine and spirits business represented for my son for many years why his mom was gone so much. So I had to also balance the like, he could have a love hate for this, you know, and I'm I'm aware of that, right? I'm aware that like, this industry that I've given my life to kept me on the road a lot, kept me gone a lot. So he was, he also wasn't like a kid that like drank at an early age. He didn't do a lot of those things because in his mind, he's like, that's what my mom is into that, you know? But he gets that this is that's some real legacy that we're building here. And, um, you know, I'm building this to have it acquired. So I know I'm going to make a lot of money. I understand that space. I've learned it at the highest level through the joint ventures that mm -hmm. I've worked on. So he he knows. So what's the what's the future for I bet you said you're building it to be acquired, yeah. but um before that, like what what's your roadmap to get to that point? Yeah, so the roadmap is again establishing that you know, I Best Wines is, is the the icon in the wine space. I think that's the first thing is for people to see that here, here goes this brand that just came in and was just so disruptive and people wanted, wanted to make sure that it was at their tables at restaurants and on their menus and at, at events. And again, I've done that for big brands. So I, I have a plan to do that for, for this, this brand, you know, ideally, um, you know, partnering with the right distributors, because I think a lot of people don't realize is those early partnerships also define the kind of acquisition you're going to have. You know, a lot of people sign with distributors fast. And, and then when it comes to acquisition times, like the cost to buy out all those distributors is crazy. So being very strategic about the distributor partners that we take on. And for me, I want the big distributors. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, like, I don't, it's a new brand. I don't see it as a small brand. You know how we always are conditioned a little business, small business. I'm like, no, this is a big business mm -hmm. now, you know. And so the roadmap very much so is built with it being a big business in mind. And then, you know, these brands, these companies, these suppliers, they need our culture. Like without our culture, without what we bring to the table, our buying power, they are nothing. And I know that. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to the day in three to five years where I'm sitting down at the table with the supplier that I think would make the right sense to do an acquisition with and doing, you know, a historical acquisition for IPS Wines. That's what I see. You, you are, I'm assuming you're still the majority owner. I know you took, you have five partners now. Yeah. Is there at any point you see yourself, I know you didn't like to use the word raise, yeah, but raise capital and perhaps have 
more people in the ownership group? Absolutely. So the the structure right now is I'm the founder. I have five women that have been working with me on this journey that I've given equity to. And then I have five women who have invested. Um, but for people who understand investments, they've invested on a convertible note. It's not equity yet. They've invested in believing in something that eventually if we determine that it makes sense for them to, to get equity, they will. Um, so I am the owner of iBest Wines. Yes, absolutely. I will raise money. You know, it gets to a point where like, OK, you can't just spend all your capital and think that you can do everything that you want to do. But I don't want to raise capital in a way where I'm forced to give up ownership of my brand. And a lot of people do that and they don't understand it. And what I can tell you is that um, I understand marketing. I understand commercial. I have a great commercial competency. I obviously understand investing. So when it comes to understanding the world of fundraising, that's been the thing that I've been educating myself the most. And so I've been really patient in, in the fundraising process because I'm like, until I get a bit of a mastery in this, I don't want to take nobody money. Mm. And I think a lot of people make that mistake, right? They make the mistake of like, I need money or I, I've heard that I should go get money, spend someone else's money. You know, all these things that you, I mean, you guys know this world owe too much. And for me, it's been hugely important for me to understand it. Like, what does it really mean to fundraise? What does it really mean to take capital? What does it really mean to have people on your cap table? Because one thing I don't want to do is find myself in a situation that I can't build this brand in the way that I know the brand should be built. And so I I, I want to just be mindful that you have to have a healthy mix mix of, I think, people that are willing to get on your cap table, but that are willing to do it in a way that makes sense for you. So yes, we'll raise, but I'm not rushing to the to the first, you know, group of people that like say we want to be a part of it. Let's be a good fit. It's it's a marriage. Yeah. You I mean, when you take investment, is it is a marriage, and they have to also have your your goal in mind. You know, not everybody wants to sell. Some people want to hold their brands forever. You know, I'm building this to be acquired. And the reason why is because I understand the opportunity in that, you know, and, and what it'll allow me to do from a, just, I think, a, a wealth building perspective. This is one of many things that I want to do, you know? So well, that's my plan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. How can they um, purchase the wine and any other information that you like? To yeah. So ibestwines.com. We have a direct to consumer model, which is I'm really excited about, right? Because we're controlling that. Um, the website is beautiful. You learn a bit more about myself, about the women that have been working with me. We also have a section that highlights global creatives because, again, this is my way of just connecting people. So we have all these incredible people that we've worked with, that we aspire to work with. Um, because I wanted the website to be a place where people can discover, not just shop, but discover as well. So ibestwines.com. My social is miss underscore ibest. And the ibest wine social is at ibest wines. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Ibest wines. Are we going to get a bottle? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. okay. Yeah. I appreciate absolutely. that. Absolutely, I, I got appreciate that. that. So we got, sure. we got. I need this in you guys' repertoire because I. I know y'all drink wine. Seen You've seen us. Drinking wine. The rumors okay? are true. Yes, the rumors are true. <laughs> yes. These guys drink wine. So. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. you coming in. And thank you. Thank you for the wine. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you guys for rocking with us. See you next week. Peace. Peace.